Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Eating at a Meeting. I am your host, Tracy Stuckrath, founder of the Eating at a Meeting Facebook group and podcast, as well as Thrive Meetings and Events. I am in Raleigh, North Carolina this week. I am dog sitting for my friend Kathy while she's at the beach. Um, And um, so I'm in this beautiful brand. Actually, I'm not even showing you her beautiful kitchen, but I'm sitting in her beautiful new kitchen. So, but I am excited to chat with today, um, Brandon Snooks, who is the owner and chef at Farm to Fire, otherwise known as Hudson Valley Barbecue Company as well. And I found him in the um, Cater Buzz Facebook group, and he was talking about what he's doing about open fire cooking. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. So I had to have him on the show. So hi, Brandon. Hello to you. Um, Okay, so open, I want to just jump right into this because you were doing open fire cooking and you're a caterer. um, And and I'm looking at your website, I mean, you're literally cooking out in the open and that's where somebody's wedding or corporate event is. So talk about open fire cooking. Yeah. So one thing that we, we can, we cook anything. It's just okay. open fire. So uh, lots of folks link open fire to, uh, you know, hanging animals up over the fire and, you know, the caveman style cooking. We do that. We also make homemade pasta. We bake bread. We make, all the stuff that uh, a catering team would make, but it's with open fire. And uh, that has a little bit uh, with my roots. You know, I grew up on a farm and we cooked a lot of stuff over open fire. So that kind of got in my blood. Okay. So is that open fire a hundred percent outside or are you doing open fire, like using gas grills inside as well? Very good question. I get that a lot. It's all, it's all wood based cooking uh, okay. outside. So we have um, live fire stuff, which is hanging the animals up over the fire or grilling. We have wood fired ovens as well. Um, So, uh, you know, a classic pizza oven kind of vibe. Um, So those those things all combined outside, we cook everything with fire. Wow. Okay, that's just so my. Well, what if it rains? (laughs) Yes. So we do have uh, a roof over most of our stuff, okay. um, like an open fire paella pit. We have, um, we do paella a lot. The, okay. the great Northeast is full of seafood lovers. Um, we do a lot of seafood paellas um, that we're scrambling a little bit, putting stuff over the pit. Um, but every single, every single piece of the puzzle ends up working out, you know, we might have someone holding an umbrella over something at the last second. You never know. Now uh, you said we've got these different, so are you, do people come to you, but you don't bring your open fire to them? We actually, every single event is off site, So we go anywhere and everywhere. Um, this year we have weddings in four States. So oh, we wow. travel everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And what kind of permitting do you need to do to do that? Well, geez. I could literally uh, get into the CIA with less paperwork. Um, there's obviously the open fire stuff. There is obviously local permits, county permits, state mm-hmm. permits. Um, I know every fire marshal on the East Coast. Um, we do. That's half of my life is permits. And you take, and, and I, this is not even what we plan to talk about, but I'm just, it's just, <laughs> so you handle the permitting and stuff for the, for the bride or the meeting planner, right? Or do Yeah. They have- well, we do, uh, we work with a ton of really great wedding planners and a lot of them will kind of take that off our plate because um, mm-hmm. they met me and they know how good a paperwork I do. So <laughs> they take that off our plate. Some of the venues uh, which we also work, you know, all over New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, at some of these old restored barns, um, horse farms, all kinds of stuff. And so they restore these old buildings. And so they have most of the permits or permitting process lined up for us. Okay, that worked. That helps a lot. Yeah, a ton. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then do you have to also bring in the health inspector at all? Sometimes. So uh, okay. each each state and then county 
And then like in New York, we have hamlets, uh, you know, a whole number of things that I didn't, I didn't know what a hamlet was in Montana. So um, sometimes there's inspectors that come to the site. Sometimes it's just a general process through the mail. They want to see what we do. Um, but we've done this long enough that most of them know who we are. And so it's, it's usually just some paperwork uh, via email. Oh, well, that's good. That makes it a lot easier for sure. The, yeah. how do, all right. So one of the things that is important to you and, and I saw it on your website and we talked about it before as well is, you know, cooking outside, but, and the food that you're making, it's, it's very much about scratch cooking and using local ingredients. So as a caterer, talk to me about how you source those, that food. Very good question. So one of the things that has really become almost a staple in our wedding circle of, of peers is people sourcing most of their product from local farms. Um, the Hudson Valley of New York is a fantastic place from vegetables to pigs, everything. So we have um, a pretty good network of folks that, I mean, they, they cater to any need we could imagine. Microgreens, we have some farmers that are planting specific heirloom tomatoes for us. Um, oh, wow. A beautiful mushroom crew, they, they grow all kinds of mushrooms. Uh, it's, it's at our disposal. Obviously, we're just a couple hours north of New York City, so a lot of people uh, might not link that to great um, to a great egg center, but it is. Um, lots and lots of second, third, fourth generation farms uh, in the Catskills and Hudson Valley that we reach out to and partner really closely with. It's, it's the heart and soul of our business. That's fantastic. Okay, now, because I'm not looking at a map, but the, is that near the Finger Lakes region? I'm pulling my fingers up. Is, right. Yeah, is that near the same area? South, south. Okay. So um, once you leave the city, um, right at the north part of New York City, um, and you cross the water and get into the lower Hudson Valley, that stretches clear up to the Capital District. It's about an hour and a half drive. Um, okay. When you go another probably hour north and west, you're going to get into the Finger Lakes. So obviously, okay. New York top to bottom is is a long drive. Um, right. But yeah, probably somewhere. I won't say the middle because the New Yorkers will have a fit if they hear <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> somewhere in the broad middle between the Finger Lakes and New York City. Well, and I'm just thinking because I was up in the Finger Lakes um, years ago with MPI Meeting Professionals International Chapter. And the, the produce that I saw up there and the wine that's produced in that area, you, you don't necessarily think that you, you know, no that clue. you're going to get that from there. I had no clue. Uh, absolutely oh, really? no clue. Um, all of it. Uh, there are people growing hops, some of the best breweries. I don't, I mean, I don't want to say in America, but I feel like in America, um, wineries, breweries, uh, places open up. Uh, meaderies. There's a fantastic distillery right in Albany. I mean, there's really a ton of stuff and the heart and soul of their product is also mm -hmm. uh, the bulk of it's grown right here in New York. So that's, it's really cool. That is really cool because, and so what is your reach when you look at local? Is that 10 miles, a hundred miles, 500 miles? Unfortunately, farther than I wish it was. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that we were really happy to see, not for us, but for the farms, COVID brought a wave of people here that started doing business with farmers versus the supermarket. Okay. So, um, you know, local crop share programs. And then mm -hmm. the farms got so busy, they weren't doing any wholesale programs. You know, which as my friend, I'm happy for that farmer and, and his family. Right. But as a, you know, as a, as a caterer, it was tough. So we've, we've branched out. From, I mean, there's there's people in Vermont we do business with, people over oh, in the Berkshires uh, across the border in Massachusetts. Um, like our, our local pig guy is an hour south in Ghent. Um, all these okay. little farms, and some of them are, have been in families forever. So it's really, it's pretty neat. That's awesome. because it And I think COVID really did highlight the farmers, right? Because you didn't want to go, you, you want to go out to the nature and get your food versus going into an indoor store, Yeah, you know, and being around people. And obviously but... su 
supply chain issues right. uh, forced people's hand. I think a lot of people recognized uh, going to the grocery store and chancing all the, the possible COVID stuff wasn't even worth it because a lot of times they weren't, they didn't have product. Right. Now sourcing locally, does it, is it hard? And I don't know what size events that you do weddings and, and other kinds of events. Is it easier because you are a smaller, uh, I'm going to just say smaller than going to the convention center, right? <laughs> you know, right. because they, a local farmer could not, and actually kind of a story that I have from a conference center in DC, he went to local um, egg farmer and they wanted to buy all their eggs from him. And that farmer said, I'm not going to give up on my consumers yeah. right. and said, no. Yep. Yeah. So similar to what you experienced as well. A hundred percent. So we, yeah. I mean, dozens of farms and at the end of the day, um, we wouldn't want them to give up on their consumers. We would, we would way rather have the people in those neighborhoods eating food where they know where it came from. You know, they know the family, know, know their practices, all of it, you know, everyone's got a story, you know, they'll reach out. Oh, you know what? I think I remember Kurt's grandpa pulled us out of the ditch in a snowstorm kind of stuff. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, I can only speak from living in a couple states. I think it's like that in most rural communities, uh, you know, growers, farmers, ranchers. I mean, they're pretty good people, but their community is everything to them. So they they're mm -hmm. really passionate people about their communities. Now, and you grew up in Montana on a farm. Um, and so this is the way you cook and where you live is kind of, it's just on the other side of the country, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, about the same plane or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah right. Close. Um, so how has that, you know, growing up, did that influence you to become, to do what you do the way you do it? And were you, did you not, um, source locally before you started, you know, farm, yeah. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, we grew a good chunk of our food in Montana. Okay. Yeah, and that was okay. something I think a lot of rural people, uh, you know, in any area that, that grows food or animals, uh, obviously you supply your own. So that was a big one. Um, when I started, uh, you know, kind of understanding what it is my parents did, um, I knew a couple things and one immediately was that I didn't think it was something I wanted to do for a career. Um, we see the end product. We see uh, a cabbage or a squash or a tomato. You know, we're holding it in one of the fancy crates at the farmer's markets and it's pretty cool. And you see someone there um, that's talking to you about whatever. And that is literally like less than 1% of the process. You right. know, seeing seeing my dad deliver cattle in 30 below zero weather, uh, frozen feet and hands and, you know, sacrificing his life for an animal. Uh, that's all over. Seeing people work, you know, 15, 16 hours a day, you know, manual labor, throwing bales, or, you know, some of the farms around here growing, um, you know, planting everything, tending the soil. You know, we had tractors, but there's a lot of folks here that, that don't use big farm equipment. It's, it's old school oh, wow. annual labor. Um, that wasn't for me. <laughs> so we always, I was always around it and appreciated it for what it was and continued to understand how important it was for me just as someone who eats food, but as someone who wants to serve food to other people, um, knowing where that stuff came from was, I mean, it's the heart and soul of our entire business, all of it, the people, not the product. Uh, obviously we're proud of the product that we serve. We're proud of the product that we buy, but we're even more proud of the partnerships with the farmers. Um, all of them, you know, their families. Uh, these are, mm -hmm. these are men and women that are on school boards and, you know, doing things in the community, coaching, you know, summer softball leagues, uh, things like that. They're good folks. Well, I, I'm going to say that you are part of that as well as a good folk. As So thank you for that. I think it's that's really, really important for people to understand. And the because you can just go to the grocery store and buy something, but you don't really think about where that came from. 
And then when you do meet the farmers and, and actually a friend of mine in North Carolina, they just lost one of their sows and female pigs for anybody who doesn't know what that is. And, you know, and, and I'm like, and they told the story and Joe's the one that's, you know, is the handles, the animals. And he, he just really put in his heart and soul in and how he posted it and what he talked about. And, and I think that, it really adds so much more value to where I know I'm getting my food from. A hundred percent. Yeah. The, um, okay. So in that same vein, that's, that comes in with land stewardship, stewardship and, and understanding that. And, and I think in COVID we saw a lot of people throwing fruits, throwing food away, farmers throwing food away because they didn't have any place to go to it. But also I, I've been hearing a lot in the last few years about, soil health and what that means and, and crop rotation and regenerative agriculture. So as a caterer and somebody who grew up on a farm, can you talk to me about what land stewardship means to you? Absolutely. Um, growing up with people who, I mean, you hear these old, old timers at the cafe talking, you know, high school football, soil, um, there's important stuff, you know, the, the new, the new tractor that came out with tracks and GPS. I mean, serious stuff at, at the cafes in these small towns, but the old timers that have done this forever and they had information passed down to them about taking care of our earth, um, planting, um, how that, that turns into, you know, obviously a harvest and then the, the full cycle, um, after the harvest, obviously, some of that stuff will die and that that root stuff all the all of it turns into organic matter you know goes back into the earth that whole cycle of of everything being taken care of uh, the animals have a major part in it you know walking around fertilizing aerating the soil but not developing the soil uh, i'm proud to live where i do um the hudson valley it's a it's a great place for that lots of these old farms are tended in some of the same ways that they're, you know, two, three generations up tended it. But they're starting to implement uh, much like other rural areas, you know, egg sciences, you know, cover crops, things like that. So they're not using pesticides. Um, still have to manage the the windfalls of, you know, is it going to rain enough? All the stuff, right. the prices, all the details. But in the end, they're they're choosing that lifestyle to take care of our earth. Obviously, feeding people is a byproduct, but but they're tending the earth. And it's, you know, without turning into a Hallmark movie, it's uh, I don't think there's any better thing that someone could do. Oh, I, and I love that. And, and actually something that you talked about earlier about small towns, it made me think of a Hallmark movie, too. So I'm glad <laughs> you said that. <laughs> yes. Yep. Oh. <laughs> so. With that, do you see that trend in catering, you know, understanding where your food comes from more, or are you still seeing it? Where do you see that state of catering in, in understanding where, who they're buying it from and understanding the soil versus traditional catering? Yeah, it's so one of the things that does come out of this is, you know, where does it meet? Where does it all meet? Because, you know, sitting here talking to you, it sounds really easy and like it's a good plan. Introduce things like feedlots. You know, mm -hmm. hey, I know the farmer, he just runs a feedlot where the animals stand in a barn their whole life. That's not what we're talking about. So it there's some navigation of it, but it's going to always be tough. One, sourcing enough product to do a wedding for 160 people might take four or five farms. Um, okay. It might take relationships with them starting on a smaller scale. It also is going to cost a little bit more. Um, so those are two major factors. But the other thing, I mean, when it comes right down to it, we, we're providing a service. And our service sometimes falls in the parameters of how, how do we navigate a price that allows us to go do business with farmers, um, okay. you know, we have mainstream providers that might have three, four dollars a pound less on on pork per pound, okay. you know, uh, or mm -hmm. beef or whatever. Um, that's a lot. And so navigating that for each 
each business can be tough. Like a deli, it probably isn't ever going to happen on a full scale, but it could happen on some scale, you know, a specific sandwich named after the farmer, the farmer, you know, with heirloom right. tomatoes. Um, just seeing all that, all that process, because it's taken a long time for us to get everything lined up where we can do it and then still be in business next year. So it, it takes time. Lots of, t it's like farming. It, it takes right. time. Well, and it made me think of a, a two sessions that I sat in at Cater Source this year. And one is a convention center chef um, who decided to get rid of his annual contract and go direct to farm. Right. And he saved the company. He's like, give me a year and I'm going to save you however much money it was that he did. And he ended up helping these farmers buy their own trucks and buy better equipment to and, and to grow themselves. And I thought that was a great story. But then the other the other session was in and, and helped me think through this is that it was a company that is a, a bulk buying company, right? He works with a bunch of different caterers to help bulk buy. Is yes. that a process as well that can help? It absolutely is. Uh, we're starting to hear more people uh, brokering and right. yeah. I mean, a great example, you might walk out and ask a farmer what time it is, and he'll say it's summertime. Um, they they just operate on different clocks. They know that they're usually working before or right when the sun comes up. They can tell you that, um, you know, it's time for supper. I'm getting hungry kind of timelines. So sometimes the, the you know, emailing catering teams might not be their strong suit. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes they have family to help do it, uh, younger folks like, uh, you know, a child or a cousin or somebody. But we're starting to just see uh, food brokerages come up that are brokering all these deals. And so a great example, we have bought some stuff, uh, blistered tomatoes. You know, we're just going to use them for sauce or something like that. We can buy stuff that they can't sell at the high end farmers markets. And so it's either they get nothing or they sell it at a discount to someone like me. That that adds up all, you know, the course of a whole year. That could be 40, 50 grand in revenue. Um, right. They just didn't have. So it's a it's a valuable thing and it's becoming really popular. Well, and I also think, too, that as a caterer, you have the ability because it's not that pristine tomato, like you said, at the farmer's market. But the ugly fruits and vegetables, you as a caterer could utilize those. Oh, 100 percent. They're going to go in a soup and 100 percent. And I think something else, obviously, I can't speak for every neighborhood in every town, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in every state. But um, once once you leave New York City, um, a lot of people aren't sure, you know, they don't know that it's not city. And so a lot of the. The really, you know, I have a lot of friends that run restaurants that are doing a ton of business with local farms. I'm really proud of our, we'll call it our neighborhood, you know, the capital district of New York and, and a little bit beyond. Uh, there's a ton, there's a huge movement. Tons of chefs are, are doing more and more and more. And I think it's that way everywhere. And I think that's really important because we just, we can't leave the tomatoes on the ground or right. What, what can you do? How can you process those through? Because if they go in a blender, nobody's going to know that the, the tomato was. They up are. The and, I mean, at some point our, our country needs to recognize how hard it is for the farmers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's typically a crapshoot anyways, you know, a uh, home in Montana got a good chunk of the state got hailed out this year. So all the work, all the money, all the stuff, and it gets hailed out and, you know, you're done. You know, a little bit of wow. crop insurance to, you know, hand you pennies on the dollar. You know, it's tough. It's a tough market. And so um, recognizing that these farms are every morning waking up to a mountain of problems. And so trying to help them to do business with them is, I mean, it's a pleasure for us. Right. Yeah. And, it, and it's, they're, they're feeding us. And we, right. yeah. I mean, one of the best jobs you could possibly ever, I mean, how much gratitude, you know, to feel that you're actually feeding other people. Exactly. Um, how can, um, or let's just talk about the state of catering. You know, we, we went through COVID um, or we may still be in COVID <laughs> depending on who you're talking to. Right. But, and as an event planner too, you know, our industry was, pretty much devastated. 
how, you know, how do we come out of that or how do caterers come out of that, you know, and, and I don't know what you did during COVID if you were doing boxes and, and things like that and, and pickups and things like that. But where do you see catering now and in the next six months, a year, five years? Yeah, I think something that did happen was a lot of people had to diversify. You know, there were just bouncing ideas off of everything. Um, you know, home meals were making every everything that they possibly could to make money. And the only, not the only downside, but the biggest downside that we saw to that, and this is something that kind of goes back to that land stewardship, the single use plastic containers are just, they're horrible. And, you know, this, this country just, you know, quadrupled, I don't even know what a number times 10 or more of the amount of plastic containers that we used in the last few years with restaurants and caterers doing things like that. It was actually horrible. Um, just horrible to see all of that. Um, all of the stuff that we were doing um, that didn't, didn't really go over that well. A lot of it isn't going to get recycled. So it's tough to see yeah. uh, from that piece. But what really came of, of the whole COVID situation for us was a year where, you know, a couple might move to the next year, but all the Saturdays are booked at their venue. So they were doing Wednesday weddings, Thursday weddings. Wow. Um, you know, and I realized I'm not 25 anymore. So, you know, we were doing 300 400 percent of the workload that we do in a normal year um a lot of caterers that i know had the problems of just keeping their business running whether it's getting supplies getting staff uh getting you know five hours of sleep in a week um it's hard to just take take your average year and times it by five and not have growing pains extreme growing pains but we also obviously found, as everyone knows, there are just folks that left the hospitality world. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff in this industry that I personally don't think will ever be the same. And staffing is number one. We used to have a list. I, it was a text group on my phone of probably 15 chefs that, you know, hey, so-and-so broke their ankle. You know, you're free to work on Saturday. Just let me know. I might have 10 or 12 text messages in 20 minutes. Now uh, that group is gone. Uh, they went and wow. some went to school, some are carpenters, some are real estate agents. You know, one, my one buddy went to HVAC school. I was happy for him, but I wouldn't have been right. mad if he flunked out and was still in my text <laughs> group. So um, that has changed the, the face of catering and the hospitality world forever. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to be the same. Yeah, it is really hard. And... I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I just, I really don't know where to go, right, from that, because it is, where do you find the people who want to do it? My niece actually is looking at getting back into it, in, into her restaurant food service while she's looking for a full-time job, right, um, after graduating. She's like, I, she actually loved it and worked at it, right, and, but it is hard work. You don't, you take sure. that for granted. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have staff, most of them have professional jobs, um, a whole gamut of stuff. I mean, we have a lady that owns a Dunkin' Donuts that works for us. Really? I, I don't know why. I think it's a food. <laughs> I don't know. But we have a lot of people that, you know, just a, a really broad group. Obviously, every cater in America has a three or four or five teachers on, you know, on their summer staff. Mm -hmm. um, there's some industries that line up well with catering. Um, always, always health care students um okay they're busy so a lot of them can go and work in a restaurant or for a caterer like me and make four or five hundred dollars in a night and then spend all day sunday studying for a nursing exam or something along those lines so um yeah i think the the health care or excuse me um the hospitality lifer they're still around mm -hmm. there's just a lot less of them um, right i think that the well just dried up a little bit. So people have to get super creative for sure. Okay. So have you seen anything creative with that on that note? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that I'm very proud of, um, 
we're starting to see and have seen um, more and more uh, fairer pay for people doing our business that aren't tipped. Kitchen staff, um, back bar staff, uh, the host folks, uh, the bussers, all the all the people, the village that makes the servers look fantastic. Um, right. Better pay, better wages, and better benefits um, across the board. You know, I've I know uh, some people that have really uh, mortgaged everything they have to get benefits to their staff, and I'm I'm proud of them. I'm proud to know them. Wow. I'm proud to see people in our industry taking strides to have people want to work there and have it be something where if, if they get hurt, they have benefits. Uh, it hasn't been known as a career path where there's great advantages long-term. So, you know, retirement stuff, uh, healthcare benefits, things that are, I mean, that's obviously important to everybody. So I'm proud right. of that. You know, a, a major COVID problem led to some good changes in our industry. Yeah, I love that. And I, the American Hotel and Lodging Association is started a new website. Um, I forgot the name of the website, but I saw this story about Gus and Tariq, I think is his name, and their oyster shuckers in New Orleans at a hotel. And combined, they've both been there 60 years, wow. right? <laughs> and combined. And, you know, and they come, they love their job. And, and somebody might think, Oh, he's an oyster shucker. No, he loves being an oyster shucker and he loves because he does it right in front of you. He's probably a celebrity in New Orleans. Exactly. And I just think that has so much opportunity for people. They, they discount what that can be in our industry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But and they it's obviously also, no hard work. That's right. a good one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because one of them has been doing that since he was like 17 or 18 years old, right? Probably and, the only job he ever had, right? Right, yeah. And yeah. he loves it, which I, I, I posted it on LinkedIn because I just thought it was an awesome story. But it there's so many good opportunities out there. But I am glad that our industry is looking at better pay and, and benefits. And I know, you know, the part-time services that you have, you're not doing that, but you might be paying them a little bit more than what they were getting paid before. Right. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I got, oh my gosh, probably seven years ago. Somebody's like, what are you doing on a Friday night? And I'm like, you want to come pour wine at a party hundred bucks for three hours? I'm like, right. okay. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yep. Why not? It ended up being a private party for Zach Brown's band or foundation, oh, nice. which was awesome. Yeah. I was just at his concert a couple of weeks ago up here. Oh, he's so good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's good. so good. Um, so one of the, um, I, I really want to talk about this too, because I love this on your website. You're like, you got a recipe from your great grandma. Let's make it for your wedding. <laughs> right. How do you do that? I mean, I mean, I know you've got the recipes and you can do that. You're a chef, but, how, but I love, cause a lot of caterers or, you know, hotel, they're like, yep, nope, sorry, this is our menus. How yeah, one that? of the things that kind of led me to this and the way we do things, uh, you know, I joke about the platinum package or the diamond package. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, nothing nothing warms your heart like the, the platinum package that 40 other brides had that year. Um, one thing that was super important to me was that these couples got to have their favorite foods on their wedding day. Um, and one thing between New York and Montana that's way different there is so much culture here that, you know, these foods are important. New Yorkers and their foods, it's, it's a big deal, mm -hmm. uh, an absolute love affair. And we have been lucky enough to have people send us, um, hey, we want this. I went down to Queens and learned how to make chana masala from, I think it was the groom's grandmother, one of their grandmothers who learned it from, you know, her grandma who probably, you know, grandma, grandma, grandma. Um, so what ends up happening is I'll be able to spend a little time with someone in their family to kind of show me how I to make it. I love that. Yep. That is of, awesome. Of all the things that I've taken from this, um, learning these things has been the absolute best. Um, and I mean, learning, Hey, don't cut the tomatoes like that. This is how we do it. Um, you know, their ways and it's what's important to them, not how the tables are set, 
uh, not the Chargers under the plates, uh, none of that. The important stuff was their closest friends and family and them having, I mean, we might have a couple that spent $40,000, $50,000 on food, but they actually are having pigs in a blanket as a past appetizer because they had a first date at uh, Coney Island or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, all the nuances to their relationship you know, can be told through that story, you know, another Hallmark movie, but it, it turns into uh, learning some amazing stuff, um, learning how to properly braid pierogi from, from someone who it was, I was just in awe. Uh, she could braid four or five pierogi in a minute. Um, wow. Perfectly braided, you know, crippled up old arthritic hands, but had, had braided a pierogi or two in her day. Um, you know, people referencing the old country and how they did it, um, things like that, which, I mean, people were in New York doing these pierogies before Montana was even a state. We didn't even have houses out there yet. Um, wow. But seeing all that has been, it's been amazing. That's the only word that that I can think of. I, to me, that just, that enriches your catering offering, right? So much more than the next guy, right? I mean, and, and you talk about how do you can, and I actually did a session last week, how do you up-level your food and beverage, right? And that's a way to up-level it. So awesome. Thank you for doing that. That's just amazing. You're welcome. Um, okay, so what is what do you wish people knew about, oops, um, what do you wish people knew about what you do? Oh, boy, I don't know if I want them to know much about <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing that I think, um, you know, I've, I've spoken at a few culinary schools and stuff. What is a what is a big difference between a caterer and a kitchen chef? You know, okay. wh what is it? What what is it that we do? Um, I would like everyone to know how lucky me and my team are. Um, not, not any kind of struggles about eating over garbage cans or any of that shit, uh, or stuff, excuse me. Um, we would love for people to know how lucky we are. Uh, really almost all we do is weddings in these, I mean, they're like resorts, you know, we're up on Wyndham mountain overlooking the Hudson Valley catering a wedding and, you know, making a decent, a decent amount of money to live. Um, those are the things that I wish people knew. I wish they could spend a day with us to see, um, you know, how lucky we are. We get to meet all these cool people and go to all these really amazing venues and, and spend some time celebrating with them and their friends and learning their traditions, um, cultural things, you know, whether it's, you know, a Chinese tea ceremony or a Sangeet, you know, the day before uh, a classic Indian wedding, just getting to see all this stuff. Uh, you you just you can't make it up. You can't watch a movie. Uh, all of it. The sincerity in the people that we get to do business with. Um, you know, sitting down and having having dinner with four generations of people, um, and the fourth generation is the only one that has ever lived in America. That's wow. that's, pretty neat. that's pretty neat. Um, so that's fun. I I would love for people to be able to know that and and get to experience it as well. Oh. I love that. That's so fantastic. Okay. So um, to wrap this up and because this podcast is about safe and sustainable and inclusive and, and actually we didn't even talk about the fact that you do make vegan meals on this open fire, right? So what, it's not just about grilling that big old sow over the grill, but what does a safe, sustainable and inclusive food and beverage experience mean to you? Well, obviously starting at the farm, um, spending enough time in that process to recognize what we take from it, we have to give back to it. Um, we take most of our food scraps and food. Some of it goes to a farm and the pigs eat it. Some of it goes into compost. But recognizing everything that we take for our event from the earth, we should try to give back. Um, obviously full circle. That's a, that's a big piece of our business. And, you know, we can all do more for that. You know, we're not uh, we're not out, you know, marching on the sidewalks, but we should be. Um, we have to give back more 
of to the growers, you know, whether it's time or money or just garbage to compost to to help the soil, all of it. And that's what that's what we see is uh, you know that circle. That's awesome. That's that's really really important in figuring it out. And I just actually forwarded um, some videos from Food Tank, which is working to get the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act updated. So it's the Food Donation Improvement of 2021, so that we can understand how we can give back and make it easier for giving donating food after the fact, right? After I love it. I yeah, love it. It's really. Really important Actually, on, that. on that note. That is something that you know we are trying to make sure that at some point we can change laws. Certain certain cities aren't allowing caterers to to feed people at, with with food that's cooked. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit of a touchy subject. You know, you try to see both sides, but there's there's people starving in our neighborhoods, and we can't give them the food from the weddings, and that's right. It's tough sometimes to to yeah. know that you know to know that yeah. we ate all this great food and a whole bunch was left over. We're happy to turn it into to compost or feed the pigs, but it would be great if we could find a better way to feed the people. Right, exactly. Oh, that's a great way to end this. Um, so, well, thank you so much, Brandon yes. Snooks. You're very welcome, um, everybody. Um, and actually, my friend Lynn Wellish was on here, and she's. First of all, she said she agrees about the single-use plastic, and she said they're not good for anything but the landfill. So we need to definitely take more look at bamboo up their compostable options. So Lynn, thank you for listening in. Well, actually, Lynn has a really Lynn has a good point, but I'll tell you what I think Lynn might agree with. I think most people would. I would love to see restaurants give you an opportunity to bring your own container. Oh, I love that. To bring yeah. your own container. Obviously, they serve a certain size, but. You know, we all have Tupperware. We all have stuff. Bring your own stuff. I would, I, you know, obviously there's healthcare or uh, health regulations, you know, with each city and town, but I would love to see that. Yep. I agree. That would be so much easier. And even going, when you go to the farmer's market, bring your own bags, you know, don't take, don't, it. yeah, all of it. Right. Um, so that you, they can actually keep their containers. Cause in, I know in Georgia, they weren't allowed to bring back the egg containers yeah. So it depends on what state it is and yep. what city. State, city, yeah. neighborhood. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So um, actually one final question for you. What is your favorite food and drink? Well, I, I am a habitual order of steaks. Um, just so many great memories of steaks. But I will say after moving to New York and spending some time in Brooklyn, Korean food is probably my favorite. Oh, wow. I okay. love bulgogi, um, the bibimbap bowls, the galbi, all of it. I just, I am, I'm not quite up to where I can handle that, you know, a classic Korean spice, but boy, I love Korean food. I just absolutely love it. That's awesome. And I think, isn't that one of the recent food trends is Korean? <laughs> <laughs> well, people heard I was eating it, so. Oh, okay. Um, That's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's some great Korean joints down in the city and I just fell in love with them. Oh, that's, that's good. Uh, next time I'm in New York, I need to check them out. Call me. I'll take you to, I'll take you to some. Okay. I will do that. That's a deal. All right, everybody. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us here on eating in a meeting. Um, really appreciate it. Everybody um, connect with Brandon um, at Hudson Valley BBQ co.com. I posted it in the chat as well. Um, and then actually also make sure that you um, join the, oh, there we go. Oh, I'm looking at the comments. Um, join the Eating in a Meeting Facebook group. There is such a thing. And we talk about food all the time. I so help. Thank yeah, thanks. Um, and until next time, next week, um, I got um, the Hotel Mogul online with us for next Wednesday, the 27th. Right here, same bat channel, same bat place. Um, let your friends know. And until next time, stay safe and eat well. Thanks. Thanks, Tracy. See ya. Thanks, Brandon.